Hey, well, we may as well begin, and I'll just uh, admit people as they start uh, carry on arriving. So thank you, everyone, for coming. And uh, it's a real pleasure to see so many of you here already. And we're going to run this session in a fairly informal way, so you're not going to be drowned with PowerPoints, etc. Um, one house rule is that the best way to communicate with us during it is using the chat function, which hopefully will work. And as um, I'll be asking the questions and Cheryl will be doing more of the speaking, I'll try and monitor the chat and um, you know, ask Cheryl questions as we go along. Um, if you really have a burning question and you really want to, uh, to speak, then feel free to just turn your mic on. Um, for most of the time, please keep your mics muted, but do turn it on if you've got a burning, burning question. And um, we are recording this session so that we can send it to people who weren't able to uh, attend. Um, so if you really don't want to be seen on the recording, then please, um, you know, you're welcome not to have your camera on. But it's nice to see so many people with their um, cameras on. Um, so we're going to be focusing, uh, obviously, on, on the Middle East. Uh, and when we say the Middle East, we're particularly going to focus on the Gulf, particularly um, Saudi Arabia and the, the UAE. But there will be a few mentions of some of the differences with other countries in the region. And um, I'm delighted to be joined by um, Cheryl. Uh, we've known each other for about three years when she came on the train, the trainer program that we run in the UK. Um, Cheryl is an intercultural trainer. She's a business consultant. She's lived and worked in the Middle East, mainly Saudi Arabia, Qatar, a bit in Dubai for the last few five years. Um, you've left now, haven't you, Cheryl? You split your time between Italy and Pakistan. So okay. you're, you're in Karachi today, that's right. I'm in Karachi now, yes, that's right. So she's going to be obviously joining us to give us advice on the culture as well as working and doing business in the region. And um, at the end, then, uh, if we've got time and for anyone who wants to or has the opportunity to stay on a little bit longer, then we'll keep it open so that you can ask a few questions um, using um, your mic and, and, and video. So I'll, I'll hand over to Cheryl to just say maybe a little bit more about herself and then we'll move on to the questions. And don't forget to use the chat. OK, Cheryl, over to you. Okay, thank you, Michael, for the introduction. And hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm really excited. I'm glad to see all of you. And I hope I'll be able to start some knowledge which will be useful to you. And if there's anything that's left unsaid or unanswered, you're welcome to contact us after the session. All right. So yes, as Michael said, we'll be covering the Gulf. Mainly my experience is in Saudi Arabia. I lived there for four years. I also lived in Qatar for half a year and I traveled extensively to Dubai. So I have some experience also in the UAE with both you know, culture and business. So yeah, I guess we could get started. Right, so um, you know, quite a few people, myself included, the first time I did business in the Middle East, I was slightly nervous because it wasn't a region that I knew in advance. And um, you know, I had all sorts of different concerns um obviously yeah. about how to behave um you know the how to behave um with people of the opposite gender etc and so i was slightly nervous about it but how easy is it to start doing business in the middle east i mean first of all from the point of view of business not so much culture then we'll move on to culture and are there any sort of strategies that you'd recommend definitely well first of all i would like to say i'd just like to comment on your um what you said about feeling uncomfortable and me too I was kind of nervous about it and then once I got there I realized that it's really easy to work there and they really do welcome foreigners and if any of you saw my article today I wrote an article on LinkedIn that explained a lot about my experience and I was pleasantly surprised by how welcoming people were how understanding they were and how much they respected women i mean i never once felt disrespected as a woman i mean if anything i felt you know praised for whatever you know individual skills i was bringing to the table and i found a, a, an enormous welcome all the time i mean people helped me they called me sister they you know they wanted to help me 
So, yeah, so that's just on a personal note, I mean, to address this situation, if you're ever worried about going to the Middle East as a, you know, as a foreigner, you don't have to worry. Actually, it's full of foreigners and they really do appreciate the input from expats and all the different skills they bring. So about <clears throat> how to start business there. Okay, I'll first talk about the relationship matters. And I'd like to say that it's really important to establish connections through your network. So if you're looking to start business there or to offer services there, it's really, really important. Try to find someone in your network that knows people in the Middle East and can introduce you because that's going to be the best way to get through to people. They generally like to work with people they know. It's kind of like Italy. If anyone is, knows Italy, I saw some Italian comments running here on the side because I, I live in Italy. Um, it's, it's similar to that. They like to, to network and to do business with people that they know. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like a face-to-face -face introduction. It can be over email. It can be just a you know, reference or it can be a, a Zoom call, but it's important to, to get introduced in some way by, by someone you know. Um, it can be done, business can be done without the personal introduction as well. It can be done. It's just easier if you know someone that can, you know, um, introduce you to someone who can help you out. Um, so maybe if, if any of you have heard of this concept, it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, popular Arabic word, wasta. Wasta, which Michael, maybe you can write that in the chat, W-A-S-T-A. Wasta is connections in Arabic. And um, it's really important to, to have wasta sometimes. And I think this happens to do with a lot of the, the fact that it's a very bureaucratic country and you know any kind of operations in government or documentation takes a long time and it helps if you know someone you know in the inside let's say and then sometimes you can pull strings in different ways by calling up people you know to help you get things done and this is just it's a normal way of doing things in the middle east they 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 usually call on people they know to help them out with, with different things because otherwise it takes a really long time and you know the language barrier is there. And so use your WASTA. Um, I think Michael, you also have a story about WASTA. Would you like to share that? Yeah, well, I was doing business for about three years in um, Abu Dhabi. I wasn't living there, but I was going out there quite regularly. And we were dealing with a government owned organization and anyone who's dealt with government organizations in the <laughs> probably uh, find that or will probably have found that it can be a bit of a challenge getting paid on time because there's a lot of bureaucracy it goes on and on and we were having a you know situation where we had done the work and the bill was already about six months late and you know, getting pretty desperate to get paid it mounted up to quite a large um, figure and I thought I've got to try and go around this a different way rather than the official channel and there was one older Emirati whom I'd met there um, in the first year, and he'd already left the company. He'd been gone for about a year, but I still had his contact. And I got in touch with him. And I said, look, I know you've left, but is there anyone you know who could help with this? And he said, oh, I'm a really good friend of the head of finance accounting. Um, I'll have a word with him. We got paid about two days later. Yes, that, that kind of thing happens a lot. So if you're not getting anywhere or you're running up against a brick wall, see if you can use your contacts to help you out. And uh, so another thing is that they like qualifications. So don't be afraid to toot your horn, gently, of course. Um, toot your horn means, you know, you can feel free to show them that you are qualified in whatever it is you're trying to do. And, you know, to make them understand you're, you're, you're qualified or certified in whatever it is you're trying to do. And then once you establish some connections, it's important to spend a lot of time building the relationship. So if you visit the Middle East, I mean, maybe right now it's not so practical because of COVID, but if one day you go there and, and visit and you know, spend time there, just allow for extra time to you know, go out to dinner with them or you know, be ready for an invitation to take a trip into the desert it's really important to spend a lot of time talking about things outside of work and show them that you're a human being and show them, you know, the other side of you, your personal side, and that's what helps them connect and it helps business go smoother, especially if you share food with them. Um, also, I would recommend not 
getting caught up in details too much in the beginning. Uh, this is a very common thing. I mean, among, <clears throat> among Westerners, we like to have things defined and have details and have contracts that are very, you know, um, detailed. Well, it's, it's something that with the Middle East that kind of evolves later, let's say. So you have to kind of look at the big picture. It's a very high context culture. So it's very focused on relationships at the beginning and details usually get defined later and as the project goes on. Okay, so just give them time and be patient. Also keep in mind that sometimes work might get dropped in the middle or, you know, as Michael was saying, payments might not happen in a timely manner. Um, or, you know, you're supposed to have a call and they don't show up and they don't inform you in, in advance. This is normal. Uh, they might turn up later. Maybe they had a family emergency and family is really important. Family comes first. So they will attend to any family matter uh, first and foremost and maybe not necessarily inform you. But don't worry, they'll show up later and just be patient. So they also attribute all success and all, all things that happen to external factors. So they say inshallah often, inshallah means God willing. And so after every promise that's made, they will add inshallah, okay? And so that, of course, it's different from Western cultures that you know we tend to think that we have control over our personal destiny and everything that happens in life. And they tend to think that, you know, God has control over everything. Uh, but the mistake that a lot of foreigners make um, is they kind of make fun of, inshallah. So um, it's, it's, you know, th this is very disrespectful. I mean, I've seen people kind of laugh and say, oh, does that mean you're going to do it or what? You know, like, it's not, it's not very respectful. So, you know, inshallah is very serious for them. I mean, it invokes their innermost, you know, deepest spiritual beliefs. So we need to respect that. Um, and a lot of times this is where trust comes in. I mean, you don't have to go into a lot of details um, in the beginning. They may say inshallah for many things, but in the end they do happen. It's just that you have to use your instinct and, and trust the process. Um, Cheryl, we had one question here, which was that uh, whereabouts in Saudi did you live and work? Okay, I lived at Kaust. It's uh, King Abdullah University for Science and Technology. It's outside Jeddah in a small town called Thul on the coast of the Red Sea. Great, thanks. I was wondering, Cheryl, about opportunities, because I believe yeah. that it's opening up at the moment in the Middle East for um, foreign, foreigners to come in and, and work. It's easier. Um, it, perhaps you could tell us about some of the opportunities, and particularly, does it vary between some of the different countries? Definitely. Okay. Well, first of all, um, a, a couple of practical matters about opening a business in the UAE or in Saudi Arabia. There are many agencies in the Middle East that do all the paperwork for you they, and all the formalities, including getting the business license, registering your company, um, visa package, uh, residence in the UAE, bank account, and everything. It's like a one package deal. They even have a system for you to do your invoices and it, it's very um, organized and it's, it's, it's pretty amazing how, how it's done in one package. So you basically just pay a fee and they will set up everything for you. Um, and there are different costs according to where you set up. So for example, in the UAE, you'll find that there are free zones and there are, there's Dubai mainland. So it's two different types of business licenses. If you open your business license in a free zone, just be aware that a lot of times you're only allowed to do business in that free zone or in a circuit of free zones, not in mainland Dubai. But if you have a company in mainland Dubai, you can do business everywhere. Of course, some people <laughs> do open a free zone license and then do business everywhere and they don't get caught, but you know, it's a risk. Um, so just be aware of the difference between mainland business permit and free zone business permit. 100% um, ownership is now allowed. That's a great opportunity, depending on the activity. Not all the activities allow it. Um, and once your company is established, you need to employ a GRO. GRO is a government relationship officer or government relations officer. Um, so this is the kind of person that will help you navigate all the bureaucracy if you need additional documents. Um, you know, they're a local person who speaks the language. 
So they'll be able to visit the public offices for you, especially if you're not like living in the UK, I mean, in the UAE full time, um, you need a government relations officer. And um, this person also, you know, um, can, can serve as someone who can connect you and can build your network. So it's really important to have a GRO. Um, if anyone's interested in actually setting up a company in the UAE, I do have a couple of names of companies that do this that I found were pretty serious. I have no affiliation with them. I'm not getting any like commission or anything. I just happened to know because I spent some time in the UAE and I was thinking about opening a, a business there at one point. And so I met with several companies and I found a few of them to be very serious. And if you're interested, I can provide them in the chat um, at the end of the session. Um, there's also the option to have a free zone, uh, sorry, a freelance visa. So that was not an option until I think 2019 or 20, they made it an option that you could get a freelancer visa. And as a single person, do all the registration, <clears throat> you go on a website, you apply, and then you do everything from your home country. You don't even need to be in the country. Someone will represent you and get you all the paperwork and the visa and everything to set up and you just show up in the UAE. Now, it was paused due to COVID. I don't know if it's opened again. It might be, but you'll need to check. All right, and then once you um, set up your business, I would also recommend getting like a business support services company to help you. Uh, one of them is called Innovation. It's located in both Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And basically this is a company that provides, uh, they can provide you with a GRO. Yes, Innovation. Um, they can help you find a GRO, but they can help you do a lot of logistics. I mean, this company is set up just for the purpose of helping people with logistics and doing business over there. So everything from staffing to IT needs, I mean, to visas, I mean, you name it, you can get um, one of these companies to help you. I don't know if they one of the big ones and it's highly, you know, reputed. So about the opportunities, well, in the UAE, let's not forget that there are seven Emirates, okay? So Dubai and Abu Dhabi are probably the two that we know the most, right? Those are the most famous. Um, well, there are seven Emirates in total. So we also have, you know, Sharjah, Ajman, Ras Al Khaimah, Um Al Khawais, and uh, Ujera. So we have a lot of opportunities to do some these Emirates are all expanding and developing rapidly. Okay? And a lot of them are also opening their own free zones and giving a lot of deals for people to open a business in the free zone. Okay? So this is one amazing opportunity. Um, for example, my husband and I really like Ajman. We've gone there several times. It's a good place to work and do business. Um, Sorry, I think there's, there's some background noise coming in from someone who's not on mute. If, if you could just mute. Okay. Um, and then, okay, so about Saudi Arabia. Right now, this country is expanding at rocket speed. So there's a new initiative called the Vision 2030. It's not that new, actually. It came out a couple of years ago. Does anyone know about the Vision 2030? What is the Vision 2030? If, if anyone wants to share. Christina, you are nodding your head. Would you like to share? Unmute yourself. All I know is that it's just less dependence on oil. Very good. That's right. So this is MBS, King Mohammed, I mean, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's plan to diversify the economy away from dependence on oil. And another big reason for it is to invest in its biggest commodity, it's, its most valuable resource, which is the people. So there are lots of training initiatives in place. It's a good time to set up, you know, training company or, you know, online training, especially because of COVID. And in addition, there are several mega projects that were launched as a result of the Vision 20. One of them is Neom. It's a new city that's being built. It's supposed to be the next Dubai. The government is investing something like $50 billion in it to, to build this huge smart city. It's actually a zone, not just a city, it's, a, it's an enormous zone. Uh, if you look it up, it's N-E-O-M, Neom. Um, there's another project, the Red Sea Project. They're developing some islands in the Red Sea to be a, a massive you know, new 
a tourist resort. There's also Amala, which is a, another big uh, wellness center. Uh, there's Kadia Entertainment City. So that's supposed to be like, you know, a big Disneyland, but, you know, with like race, race tracks and all kinds of other, you know, uh, entertainment facilities. There's Jasara, that's another big uh, construction project. Uh, there's Capsark that, that's been around a few years. And of course, there's always a Ramco, which has been around forever. That's another opportunity to, to work in. Um, it's a great place to work, as I've heard. Um, so anyway, they're trying to attract multinationals to what's called uh, Program HQ. It's uh, an initiative to attract people to put their um, headquarters in the King Abdullah Monetary District in Riyadh. And they're giving them something like 50 year tax holiday and a lot of other benefits. So there's a lot going on in the country right now and it's a good time to invest. It's high risk, but high return. There's very low tax and some of the best sectors to invest in right now would be entertainment, believe it or not, entertainment, even though we have COVID, they're still building a lot of these, you know, the entertainment city and a lot of other places, tourism, restaurants, food and beverage, especially like online delivery apps and, and online uh, food delivery programs, media and technology, education and training, and healthcare. So this is the list of sectors that was given to me by my partner in Saudi Arabia, who's helping me help clients open businesses over there. So um, this comes straight from the horse's mouth from someone who's you know in the business of opening new companies for foreigners. Um, there's a 20% tax on companies that have a foreign uh, shareholder. Otherwise, um, there's only 5% tax on repatriation of profits. And for in income, like individual income tax, it's 0%. So there's a lot of, a lot of good reasons to invest in the Middle East right now. Cheryl, thanks ever so much. A lot of information there, and I'm sure it's very useful for people. Um, you mentioned earlier on the importance of networks, and I wondered yes. you know, very briefly how any advice on how to build a network if you don't have one when you first start. Absolutely, doing this is a really good question. Um, what I would suggest there are several ways to build networks. Um, as you know, a lot of people are doing business online now, and they're connecting in different events, just like this one. Um, so you can sign up for webinars and, and any informational sessions you find out about. Um, plus, you can check with all the consulates. Like if you visit the UAE and you, you can visit your country's consulate and most consulates do have a section that is, you know, that their business is to connect people who are trying to open business in the country. Uh, they have different resources and they have different events you can attend and different people that work in this field so they can help you. And then there's a couple of websites. One of them is internations.org. Maybe you can put that in the chat, Michael. Internations, it's a, it's a, it's a like big international network of, it's like a social network of people that wanna meet other people in, when you're in a different country. So I've used this in practically every country I've lived um, from India to Korea to you know, Saudi Arabia. And um, I found it very useful. There are some groups that are inside internations that you can join that are specifically for business networking. Um, there's also meetup.com. So meetup.com has a lot of groups within it that cater to certain interests. So you can go on meetup.com and you can sign up for certain groups that exist in the UAE that you're interested in. So for example, when I was in Dubai, I went to a speed business, what was it called? Speed business uh, networking event. So if you know what speed dating is, who knows what speed dating is? Okay. So this was like a speed dating event, but it was speed business networking. So people were, you know, sat across from each other and then you had like five minutes to talk and exchange your business cards and talk about what you're doing. And then, you know, as the bell rang, you would switch and talk to somebody else. Um, so I met a lot of people doing business and setting up business for foreigners over there in that event. Um, I would also recommend like LinkedIn. LinkedIn has a lot of groups. It has a lot of, you know, business and, and networking in the UAE or, you know, you can even find specific groups like 
networking in the UAE, in, networking in Dubai, networking in Abu Dhabi, networking in Sharjah. I mean, there are so many. So check out all the online resources. There are so many. Right. Um, well, that's, uh, that's really useful. I mean, the networking is just so important, isn't it? Absolutely. You can't have WASTA without a, a network, I suppose. Um, let's just have a quick sort of round the table look at different countries in the Gulf, particularly. And could you sort of quite briefly just give a couple of key words about each one and some of the differences, Cheryl? Yes. Um, well, it's such a short session, I would really love to go into detail. But um, basically, what I can say is that, you know, all of the countries of the Middle East Gulf share the same underlying cultural beliefs, and strong sense of, you know, um, Islam. Uh, so the, the values are very similar. Um, but the countries are quite different when it comes to living and doing business. So I would say, you know, Saudi Arabia is still quite conservative, although it's changing at you know record speed at, at the moment. The last three years, a lot of a lot of changes have been made. Um, but let's say that I mean, in my experience overall, generally speaking, all the countries on the east of the Gulf, so Bahrain, Qatar, UAE, they're more flexible and open and easier to do business. So just to give you a few figures. I think in both uh, Qatar and UAE, there are 88% foreigners, if you can believe it. 88% of the population is from other countries and 11 or 11 and a half percent is actually native to the place. So that, that right there goes to show you how open they are. I mean, the you know, UAE is built on you know, inviting people from all over the world to do to do business and to to add, to add to their economy and to their culture and everything. And also just to give you another idea, the UAE ranks 16th overall in terms of ease of doing business, according to the World Bank doing business report in 2020. Bahrain was 43, Saudi Arabia was 62, Oman was 68 and Qatar was 77. OK, that's according to the World Bank. Um, but yeah, Saudi Arabia is getting to be a great place to do business. And there was a 54% increase in 2019 alone, just um, in foreigners opening their business over there. Um, I had a couple of questions come through. Um, yeah. The first one was, um, um, hang on. So um, uh, yeah, so we've been focusing quite a bit on setting up the business in the Middle East, but um, how about doing business with corporations there and uh, being paid in your home country and the yes, absolutely, in absolutely. the US particularly? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. That's always a possibility. And um, that is something that you can arrange through your personal networks and also just maybe visiting from time to time once things open. But yeah, you can absolutely work from your home country and get paid directly from, from there. That's not a problem. Or you can go for short periods. You can go for short you know, visits and, and maybe spend a little time just to get to know people. But you can definitely keep your home country as a home base. Absolutely. Another question, um, and it's going back to networking. So uh, how can more junior members of organizations set up networks in the Middle East? So, you know, do the organizational or social hierarchies inhibit networks being set up if you're more junior? Um, I don't think so. I think it's 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 just as easy for junior members. Okay, so how can more junior members of organizations set up networks? I mean, there's no um, limit to to you know how much experience you need to set up a network. I mean, you can be a fresher out of university and you can still get involved in, in meeting people and, and talking. I mean, it's all about, you know, it's all about the relationships that you build. It's all about the time you spend with people and how much you show them, you know, how passionate you are about your work, how knowledgeable you are, how trustworthy you are. And I think it, it can be done by anybody at any level and at, at, at any stage in their career. Um, let me just see the second part of that question. Do organizational social hierarchies inhibit what does, I'm sorry, what does this question mean? What, are, what do you mean exactly by, by the second part of this question, uh, Patrick? Yeah, um, so just in, I guess in terms of let's say age groups, for example, 
Um, are there certain perhaps limitations to me, let's say someone in my early 30s setting up a um, business or social relationship with someone in their mid 50s, for example? Oh, um, no, there's there's nothing like that. I mean, yes, we there is. OK, so Middle East culture does kind of have a hierarchy, but I don't think that you'll be inhibited. I mean, early 30s, I mean, it's perfectly fine. There are 20 year olds that go there and, and set up business and set up a network. So don't let anything, you know, inhibit you or scare you because actually, I mean, I think in the Middle East, generally, they they know nowadays that they need, you know, fresh blood, they need fresh ideas. And in fact, there are a lot of programs, by the way, that are um, investing in innovative ideas. And these always come from young people. I mean, not always, most of the time, a lot of them come from young people. So they look forward to this kind of young energy to bring, you know, to, to add value to their economy and to their society. So don't be afraid of the age. That's perfectly fine. I mean, I worked with people of all different ages, even though they say there's a hierarchy, maybe there is, but somehow it seems in general that foreigners are not subject to the, the underlying societal rules, if you know what I mean. Um, I didn't find anyone like putting me down because of, you know, I was younger than them, or I didn't find any, you know, discrimination on the basis of being younger. I mean, no, I think there's no issue at all. Thank you. Cheryl, thanks uh, for asking the question, Patrick. Cheryl, uh, you've been looking a little bit about some of the country differences, but any other cultural differences between the different cultures within the Middle East? Yeah, that's a good question. Definitely. I mean, so yeah, we've been talking a lot about like Middle Eastern culture, but actually, since the Middle East is a big cultural mix itself, we need to be familiar with some other predominant cultural groups that are there. In order to do business successfully, you may not deal with an Emirati or a Saudi. You might deal with someone from um, another uh, country. So the main cultural groups are like India, Pakistan, Philippines, Lebanon, Egypt, uh, Syria. Those are the main uh, other you know, cultural groups that you might work with. Um, Westerners, meaning like you know North Americans or, or Europeans, are still a very small minority. It's only a, a, a like single-digit percentage in each country of the population that lives there. So um, yeah, I think actually I read something yesterday saying that um, the Far East Asia makes up 59%. So India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh makes up 59% of the population in the UAE. So it would be very beneficial to, if you have experience also with Indian culture to understand uh, some of those cultural values if you're gonna work in the Middle East. Um, I know we're in times of COVID, so obviously face-to-face -face meetings are limited. Obviously yeah. we have, that's gonna be improving and um, I'm not sure what the situation is in the different Middle Eastern countries at the moment as regards face-to-face, -face. Mm -hmm. but I know from my own experience that in general, face-to-face -face is pretty important. Um, so can you say a little bit about that and you know, how much to spend in terms of budget and time, what to expect when cultivating new customers? Absolutely. So what you said about face-to-face, -face, I would like to illustrate this point through a story. <laughs> I'll start this out with a story of something that happened to me. Um, <clears throat> one of my lovely colleagues in, in my university where I worked, um, I will call him Amir, but that's not his real name. Um, so we were friends, okay, and we used to work together and, you know, we used to help each other with things. And one day I asked him for a report. Actually, I asked him probably about eight or nine times for the same report. Um, I asked him in passing, you know, sometimes I would see him, uh, hey, can you send me that report? I was really busy in that period. I didn't spend a lot of time with him and I never got the report. And then one day I was thinking about it and I was like, okay, how, how should I solve this? I'm a cross-cultural trainer, <laughs> right? I need to spend time with him. So I went to his office, I sat down, I didn't talk about the report. I just, we were, you know, chatted for half an hour. We had some small talk about, you know, traveling, uh, you know, vegetarian food, uh, random things we were talking about. And it was such a nice chat, you know, about half an hour. And on the way out, I just casually reminded him uh, that, you know, can you please send me that report? And by the time I got back to my desk, it was in my in email inbox. 
So I'm, you know, this story, it just goes to show you that if you're using some method that's not working, maybe you need to spend time with people because they really need that face-to-face -face contact. They tend to be a collective culture when it comes to working together. They like to work together with people. And if you're, if, you know, if you're, if it's not working, then maybe you can offer like, Hey, can we look at this together? Or can, you know, what do you, what do you say? We have a meeting and, you know, try to work this out. So that's, that's really important about face-to-face. -face. Now, yes, you're right, Michael, that uh, nowadays face-to-face -face is not that practical, but um, what I found overall, it was a pleasant surprise actually, that um, they adapted really quickly. And I mean, when the pandemic hit in February last year, I mean, like my university was, was on top of things and by first week of March, everything was online. Like everything had somehow shifted online. We were, we were working from home from March 15th onwards. Um, some very high tech systems were in place by the Saudi government to track um, different repatriation flights and people wanting to go home and come back and things like that. Really, really amazing. I was really surprised by how fast and how efficient things were. And people are using Zoom for meetings. I mean, Zoom is the next best thing, right? I mean, we are face-to-face -face sort of here. So um, yeah, it's our next best option. Um, what you'll find is that when you try to communicate an email, a lot of times you won't, you may not get a reply. I mean, in a timely manner, uh, you may not get a reply at all. Um, this is sometimes due to the language barrier. Of course, it's harder for them, you know, to write emails. Um, and plus they just prefer the relationship orientation. They just prefer the face-to-face -face contact. And so if you're, if you're writing emails, not getting a reply, Maybe you can just ask for a Zoom call, or I know that a lot of people use WhatsApp. I mean, I don't know if all of you have WhatsApp, but WhatsApp is very, very popular in the Middle East as far as communicating, and you can expect an answer better through through that. So yeah, um, about your question, Michael, about when you go there and, and time factors, yes, you need to allow a lot more time than you would ever think is needed in the UK or in the US. You need to spend a lot of time waiting for documents to get finished, uh, to, for negotiations to take place. Things might get, you know, postponed. Uh, there's a lot of bureaucracy. So in general, you know, just keep in mind that um, Arabs do know how to enjoy life and their priorities are with their family and religion. Um, it doesn't mean that they don't work hard. They do. I mean, I've seen a lot of really hardworking uh, people in the Middle East, but just keep in mind that family is first and religion. Is first. Um, so it's always good to leave a little more time, maybe a lot more time um, than you would expect to do business. Leave time to, to socialize with them, leave time to, you know, for the negotiations to finish. Uh, you know, it, it's, you know, it, it can be a pitfall if you're planning a very tight schedule you know, and then you're, you're, you're expecting this and this and this and this and this to happen one after the other. Um, just allow for a lot of flexibility in your plans. Um, Cheryl, when you, we started talking about face-to-face, -face, you mentioned your experience with the colleague and you got something done by meeting face-to-face -face and you mentioned small talk. Yes. What might some good topics be for small talk with um, the people from the region? Okay, well, sure. I mean, with men, you can always talk about cars and football and gadgets, you know, man things. Um, with both men and women, you can talk about food, travel, how beautiful their country is. They love compliments, pay them compliments on their accomplishments in business. They love flattery, nothing wrong with that. Um, and of course, how beautiful their country is. Uh, with women, you can talk about fashion, uh, brand name things. They love their brand names, travel. And you know what? Nowadays, you're going to find a lot of people that are very forward thinking, very modern, especially the younger generation. They're into a lot of things. I mean, I mean, I was my mind was just blown by how uh, how many things I could actually discuss with them. I mean, everything from technology to languages to vegan food, they knew about it and they were able to have a great conversation. So I think it's really easy. I mean, Arabs are fantastic conversationalists. They will never give up a chance to have a, you know, a coffee and a good chat. So I don't think you have to worry about anything there. Is there are there any subjects that one 
should really avoid? And if there are any that, are, I mean, there's some obvious ones, I think, like religion. This is, yeah, this is a good question. But any, any others that we might not have thought of? Yes. Okay. So, I mean, the things to avoid saying and doing uh, pretty much have to do with either like pride and shame and image. So they like to preserve image and their uh, one strong cultural value is saving face. So what does saving face mean? Does anyone know what saving face means? Can you explain it? Yes, please, Anne. Unmute yourself, please. Ah, yes. So saving face is preventing at all costs being embarrassed by anything. So I actually have a, a really good example. Years ago, I was doing, a, um, I worked in medical affairs for a large pharmaceutical company. We were doing some training in Singapore with the entire Asia PAC region. And the agenda, which we typically did in North America, Latin America, and Europe, on day three, there's a huge open Q&A because we've just given them all this information. And so we opened up, I sent the agenda in advance to the, um, my colleagues in Asia. And I asked them, would this work? Is this the type of thing that would work with your audience? Please let me know. I got the big thumbs up. Everything was great. We go to the session and there's crickets when we get to asking the question. No one will ask a question in front of somebody else. But when I went back to ask, so we went to break very quick and we had to um, do it in a different way, which I'll explain. But what was interesting was I went back to one of my colleagues and I said, listen, I sent you the agenda. Why wouldn't you tell me this would it work? And they said, because I was the highest ranking person to send the agenda, therefore they would never question it. So you had hierarchy going on and then you had you know, my, my lack of knowledge, this was 20 years ago now, that, that they would not ask a question in front of someone else. But what they would do is I said, okay, how about you ask some questions that your customers, your physicians would like to know about this? They're happy to ask a question for someone else, but they would never do it for themselves for fear of looking embarrassed. And particularly when the president of the company had, been, had come in for that part of the session and didn't know and sat down and they would, I mean, honestly, I got 250 people and not one person, you're standing on the stage and no one would ask a question. So I learned the hard way about saving face. Thank you very much. Anne. And, uh, Anne, you like to comment, Cheryl. Uh, I, I mean, we were talking the other day about something that's obviously part of this, which was um, shame, even the word shame. Yes, yes. In fact, so thank you, Anne. That's a really good story to illustrate this concept. And yes, saving face means preventing embarrassment of yourself and of others. Now, um, yeah, talking about shame. So what happened was um, in the university, one of the professors uh, wrote an email to a student that was absent, you know, from class saying, um, oh, it's, it's a shame you couldn't come, but um, here's the homework assignment. Now, what does it mean if you say it's a shame? Um, well, it normally, you know, it, it just, it's just, it's a way of saying, I'm sorry you couldn't come, but it's no problem. I mean, it's, I'm just sorry, we, we missed you, okay. Um, but this student took it literally and she reported it and it went all the way to the Dean. And that poor instructor got a, a warning letter or something out of it. So yeah, so just be careful about idiomatic expressions and the use of language in certain ways. Um, I think you might have a story about that too, Michael. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it took place in the Middle East, but it was a Brit and a German, but it's just the way in which words can be misinterpreted. Yes. And a lady on one of my courses, um, actually at Oxford, she had been a, an assistant to Tony Blair when he was working in the Middle East, when she prepared a report for him. And he, she went to see him and he said, yeah, I've read the report. He says, it's a no brainer. And she left and apparently she said, I was crying all night because I thought Tony Blair had said I had no brain. And then I talked to a British friend at breakfast and said, you know, Tony Blair thinks I'm an idiot. So he said, can you just say what, exactly what he said? He said, of course, it's a no brainer. It means a self-evident idea. And so you know, your word shame as well was a great example of that, that it's taken as you've done something that you should be ashamed of. Exactly. And for them, yeah. Cheryl, I'd like to move on because I can see the clock ticking. Sure. Yeah, the clock is ticking. And we a have a, lot topic that a couple of people have mentioned, which is, um, well, for me, it was a big one when I first started working in the Middle East and, and the role of women and how one relates to that. Um, Okay. Know, like, particularly as a Western man. 
This is a good question. I can honestly tell you that I never once felt disrespected because I was a woman. If anything, they were looking out for my well being and my happiness. And they were always asking me how I was doing and calling me sister. So, and there were many times when I was, you know, a, a single female teacher inside a room full of Saudi men. So imagine, I mean, talk about, uh, you know, scary. No, uh, not, not once did I ever feel uncomfortable or disrespected or, or anything. I mean, I honestly, I've, I've never experienced it. I think in general, Arabs do understand that, you know, women from other countries may have a, a slightly, you know, more like more elevated position and they respect that. I mean, and just in general, when dealing with foreigners, I mean, keep in mind that all the Middle East countries have a great deal of, you know, expat population. So they're used to dealing with foreigners. They're, they're very appreciative and it's very easy to work with them because they, they know they have a lot of experience working with expats. They understand our culture and, you know, if anything, they appreciate what we bring and they don't, uh, there's no, I mean, I didn't feel any discrimination. No, not, nothing like that. No, I felt it. I mean, the first time there, I was hosting an HR conference, a big one, the whole of the Middle East in Dubai for a few days. And, um, and I was particularly nervous the first time we went for lunch because I ended up at a table surrounded by um, ladies who were, you know, pretty much covered up. But um, there was no sort of problem at all. Um, you know, it really animated conversation, talking yeah. about lots of different things. And I mean, I found there are obviously certain things one shouldn't do. You know, don't be the first to offer your hand because it depends on which woman you're dealing with. Have they lived or been educated in the West or have they not? I mean, at the place that I was working, we had one incident where a senior Korean manager went up to a, a you know, a, a, an Emirati lady whom he was working with, and he hadn't seen her for a while, and he gave her a big hug and kissed her on both cheeks, and you know that was obviously a terrible faux pas. And I spoke to a colleague of hers, and she said, you know, she'd be absolutely traumatized. And then other things like, you, you know, you shouldn't if the lift door opens and you're male and you see a single woman in the lift, just nod and wait and let the lift go. Don't get in the lift at the same time. And I think you pick those things up, you know, ask for local knowledge. But in general, I found it, um, you know, extremely um, easy, really. And the, the other thing that I've noticed is that certainly in the organisation I was working with, that if you compared the um, work ethic and the quality of the younger women compared to the younger men, the women were far superior. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I talked to my old Emirati friend about this, and he said, well, if you think about it, you know, when I was young, and my parents particularly, we had nothing, you know, we were nomads, we didn't have the oil, and, um, and so we were, you know, we were really ambitious once we got oil to make our country strong, a big lot of national pride, but he said the young men, you know, they've got a Maserati, and a, and, a, and a Lamborghini in the garage, 25 years old, a nice title on their business card. And so they're not as motivated as the women who are really motivated because they uh, want to do better than the men. They want to prove themselves. So it's not about money. Um, I mean, is, has that been your experience? That's definitely true. I mean, I, I met some Saudi women who were amazing. I mean, extremely hardworking very intelligent, very articulate, um, very well trained. I mean, they go for trainings all the time. Um, there's a lot of initiatives of the government to, to train women, especially on leadership. And some, I mean, we had some women, Saudi women who are in the upper echelon of like, you know, admit, you know, top level in the university. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're very modern. A lot of them, I mean, some of them have lived abroad, some have not, but, I mean, even the ones that lived, that never lived abroad. I mean, I met so many Saudis who spoke perfect English without an accent even. And I used to say, how did you learn English? Like, and then did you live in the US? No. Well then how? Oh, I just watched American movies and what? I've been living in your country for four years, studying Arabic like a dog for four years. And I, <laughs> I'm still, you know, like a low intermediate level and you're speaking like a native. I mean, it's incredible. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, I mean, in my experience, uh, again, it's quite often the, the younger women who have absolutely brilliant English. One of my main contacts, you know, if it was on the phone, she could be from New York. I mean, she had a strong... You know, right? Because you know, um, someone just asked a question about the, um, the, the, the language. Um, oh, okay. How, that's from Rakesh. Hi, Rakesh, how are you? He's on mute. Hi, okay. I'm doing good. <laughs> good to see you. Well, yes, yes, yes. Um, how yes. good? Oh, there you are. Hello. Yeah, hi. How good are the Saudi nationals in community? Yes, okay. Um, you'd be surprised. I mean, there are varying levels, but yes, I mean, I met many of them who are fluent in English. And I think this happens because a lot of families have um, like a Filipino nanny and the Filipino ladies all speak English. So they need to communicate with them and their kids communicate with them. And so that's where it starts. And then of course with social media, it's become much easier to learn English. And a lot of them watch YouTube and all these free tutorials that are out there now. And of course movies and all the, like the pop culture stuff. And I never found uh, language as a challenge the only thing is that they're not into written communication. That's like, as I mentioned earlier, um, verbal communication is, is always better for them. They prefer it. It's easier for them because they can see your face and they can see your expression. Uh, but writing for them is more difficult. I mean, it goes in the opposite direction. They write right to left, we, <laughs> left to right. So obviously, you know, for them, it, it takes a lot more mental energy to, to write in English. So yeah, that's why it's always good to um, do things over the phone or over Zoom. Cheryl, we're, we're sort of coming towards the last few minutes, though obviously we can carry on a bit longer for people who are able to stay. So I wonder if we could deal with the last three or four yeah, questions I was going to ask you very quickly and yeah. then um, you know, get a quick answer, but then we could go back and elaborate. You can jump to negotiation, I think, Michael. Yeah, so, th well, there was one um, about the importance of working with a local partner. Oh, yes. Do most people opt to have a partner from the region? Okay, so this is a good question and a good point. Um, so there are obvious advantages to having a local partner. I mean, if you have a local partner, it's somebody who speaks the language, who knows the culture, who knows the, the, the government offices, who can help you navigate the bureaucracy and get stamps for you and make connections for you. So obviously there are some advantages. And then of course there are some disadvantages because if you get a partner that's not as passionate as you are about your business, there you go. I mean, you know, so you have to, you have to weigh the, the pros and cons. I think we've already dealt with the next question I had, which was about how to communicate uh, particularly during COVID time, and we, we've sort of looked at yeah. works. Uh, WhatsApp is 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 good, so we've dealt with that really. Um, we have looked quite a bit at the role of Islam in daily life, um, but is there any one or two points that you'd like to make further on that? I mean, for example, Ramadan. How does that affect things? Definitely. So just be aware of when Ramadan falls. I think this year it starts in April. So keep in mind that Ramadan and Eid are going to be like Christmas, New Year in other countries, okay? So things move slowly and people are not focused on work. They're focused on their prayer and their fasting. Things do happen, you know, they take longer to happen. It's not that people don't work. It just takes a little longer. They have shortened work days. So like at the university, people were going home at two o'clock. If you're a practicing Muslim and you were fasting, you went home at two o'clock. Um, and then you'll find that everything flip flops. So everything's open in the evenings and you'll find people doing work late at night, which could benefit some of you depending on where you're located in the world. Maybe it matches better for you in terms of time zone. But um, they tend to do everything at night uh, because they're sleeping in the day because they're fasting. So just keep that in mind. Great. And then the last two questions before we open it up for those who can stay a bit longer. Um, the first one was about negotiation style. And the yeah. second was about really pr presentation style. What's your audience expecting? And the two are connected in one way, because in some yeah. ways they're both about persuasion. 
any quick tips about negotiation? If you give yes, us- I'll try to cover it quickly. I realize we're running out of time. Uh, first, I would like to say that some of these tips come from uh, like their firsthand experience from people that I know that have you know done negotiation of, in procurement, uh, oil and gas, um, etc. So first of all, you need to have a powerful relationship manager who's a local, and that's where your GRO comes in. Okay. Um, your company needs to have a good reputation and good connections. Um, Arabs tend to be hard negotiators. They're good at it. They can be quite cutthroat. You need to study and prepare well everything that you're going to present. You need to study the, the company very well that you're presenting to. You need to know about them. You need to you know, come out with different facts and things and show that you know the company. Um, you need to go into negotiation with a very high margin for negotiation, like a high margin to give discounts because they will ask, they will always ask for discounts. Um, it's sometimes hard to get uh, a yes at first, especially from foreigners. And that's where your relationship manager comes in. Um, but yeah, you, you, you usually get a no at first. So be prepared for that. Um, also try not to let them talk too much. They're very highly verbal culture and they, they like to overtake the conversation. I've heard that Arabs are better listeners one-on-one -on -one than in groups. So, um, you know, some of my, my Saudis actually told me, <laughs> don't let them show off too much. This is Saudis negotiating with Saudis. They said, don't, don't let them show off too much because then they get an edge over you. Don't let them talk too much. Um, and be sure to show solidarity among your team, because as, as a culture that, you know, is, is very highly group oriented and relationship oriented, if they notice any discord among your team, it could damage your position with them. Okay, uh, so be, be aware. I, I just had one point on listening. I remember a Saudi I was speaking to, he said, look, people think we're not very good listeners, but he said, can you listen to three conversations at the same time? Yeah, good point. I mean, it, it's true that they do talk on top of each other and overlap. And, you know, it's not like a linear active culture where one person talks, the other one listens and then switch, you know, it's not like that at all. Very active conversation. Um, as far as presenting some quick tips, um, Arabs generally do like a personal touch. So you can use partnership words like we and us and our project, our collaboration. They tend to like American showy presentation style they themselves are very animated. I think Michael said that in one of his stories that people are very animated in conversation and that's how they like presentation. So don't be afraid to put some energy into it and entertain a bit if you can pull out the entertainer in you. Um, they do like rhetoric and eloquence as well. They appreciate this, but be aware and be careful of like humor because they don't always get jokes, especially like dry British humor. So be aware that they may not understand um, let's see what else. They, they like to laugh though. So they, they do like a good laugh. Just make sure it's clear what you're trying to joke about. Also your physical appearance is very, very important. So, you know, wear your suits, like dress, dress, you know, to the nines. I mean, make, make sure everything, hair, makeup, everything is done very nicely and very neat because appearance is very much uh, key for them. And you'll find that Arab men generally wear the, the full white uh, formal dress, which is called a thobe. And the women usually wear a baya when doing business. Um, <clears throat> do show your expertise. As I mentioned earlier, it's not a bad thing to toot your own horn. They do appreciate qualifications, education, and experience. And I'm always amazed, um, you know, the men there when they're wearing the thobe, how they manage to keep them so clean and pressed. It's I always wondered that myself. Yeah. They're, they're white, but they're very clean. Yeah. And they drink coffee all day. So it's like, how would you never spill coffee on yourself? It's, know, it's, it's always it's... late. <laughs> yeah. So I think we're going to have to sort of wind up the formal part. But I know some people had some um, specific questions. Um, and um, let me just see if there's anything else here. Oh, do um, Western um, women wear a veil? Is it a good mm -hmm. idea to wear a veil? No, it's not necessary. Um, I will tell you, though, that in Saudi Arabia, I do wear the abaya, even though um, sometime last year, um, Crown Prince MBS did get on national news and he did say that women are not required to wear the abaya anymore. 
So for the first time in history, I mean, for the first time in probably, I don't know how many years, I saw people not wearing a bias, but it's, it's not only, I mean, it's, it's also a matter of culture and of habit. So most women are still wearing a bias. And as a matter of respect, I wear an abaya when I'm in Saudi, just, just to be, just to be sure and show respect. I wear the abaya. I don't mind wearing it. It's a nice black, you know, cover and it's fine, but I don't cover my head. No. I, I, I'm quite close to a Norwegian uh, cross-cultural trainer who um, had done quite a bit of work in Saudi. And she told me the first time she went, she decided she'd wear the full thing. So she had the veil and the headdress and everything and only her eyes showing. And she said that she was walking down the corridor um, in wherever she was, this uh, training center or hotel. And um, she saw this woman similarly dressed coming towards her. And at the last minute, she thought she's going to hit me. And she jumped out of the way and banged herself on the wall. And she realized there was a mirror. It was herself. And she hadn't recognized herself because she wasn't expecting to see herself. Oh, my goodness. She wasn't used to seeing herself like that. <laughs> That's funny. Good. So any, um, any other questions that people have? And, uh, I mean, at this stage, just feel free to put your microphone on. And, um, you know, do, do you, Cheryl, have anything else you'd like to end with or um do you think we've covered most of the things we intend? I think we've covered most of it but yeah if anyone has any burning questions please feel free to ask oh by the Me. way if there's a, a book that you could recommend <laughs> perhaps you could put it in the chat um there specifically about middle east culture yeah i think it was about um the middle east culture yeah okay there is one book called the bro code of i think it's the bro code of culture or the bro code of Saudi culture or the Saudi bro, code, something like that. The bro code of culture. Um, it's basically, I think, I think it's three or 400 pages of tweet sized like tips and lessons on the culture on different topics. It's pretty mind blowing. Like it's very, very detailed written by a Saudi guy who's a cultural expert. Hi, um, I think we've got another question from Monaco, is that right? <laughs> yes, 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 Michael, thank you very much. Hello, Cheryl, so happy to see you. Sorry, I'm with mask. I'm in the, in, at the airport now. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, I have a question. As I work in, a lot with the hospitality sector. Um, how do they make a choice? What is important to them, for example, in the, in the choice of the hotel? What is important to have inside? And the second question straight away, do they have some kind of uh, superstitions which are common mm. in the Middle East? You know, because I mean, for Chinese people, it's obvious Russian too, but I know for them also, what is still on? You know, what, what is majority of people are believing in? Uh, okay, so I can comment on a couple of things. I'm not sure about superstitions, but what I can tell you just from experience and knowing Arabs, I think they love luxury. So they love really, you know, posh facilities. They, they really like the best quality of everything. And if you want to cater to Arab clients, I would suggest having a prayer uh, mat in the room. You know, um, I, I'm not sure how to what level you want to um, cater to your Arab guests, but I would recommend having a prayer mat because they always need a prayer mat in, in any, you know, public place so that they can. And, and they, they usually need to know which, which direction is towards the Kabbalah so that yes. they can, you know, some arrow. Like I've seen hotels with an arrow on the ceiling pointing towards the Kabbalah so they know which way to face this prayer mat. Um, about superstitions, I'm not really sure, um, but they, they do also like to have rooms with balconies because many of them smoke, so they like to, to smoke mm -hmm. outside. Um, what else? Uh, hmm, I'm thinking as far as hospitality, I know they love to travel. So, um, you know, and they love to, to go to, are you in Monaco? Is that Yes, I am. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, I'm sure that they, they would find uh, a lot of places that are to their liking in Monaco because Monaco is a very, you know, luxurious, known for its, you know, high, high class facilities. Because, you know, we still have a lot of clients that are sitting at separate table, for example. Oh, yes. So, okay. and the service and the people in service, they also always wondering, should we serve women first? 
like you know okay. in, in European cultures we serve women first or should we serve men first you know, they, so that's that that's what is, probably there is something yes you know. you're absolutely right and and that's another thing I could mention also to the to the wider group here is that a lot of times like men and women will still sit separately and at the airport there's a separate line for women and a separate line for men now as far as serving which gender first women or men um honestly i think that when they're in a western country you know uh, some some flexibility can be there because they're in your country you know they're in another country so they understand that things okay. won't necessarily always be to their preference but i did notice i mean in the middle east you always find the male restroom closest to the door like first the woman always mm -hmm. has to walk farther and they usually do serve men first and men men usually walk inside a door first mm -hmm. not, not because it's you know it's not a disrespect to the woman but it's because they believe that he should enter first so in case there's any danger on the other side of the door he'll be able to protect his woman who's walking behind him so okay, i've heard it yes yeah this thing about ladies first that we yes. like, foreigners think of doesn't apply in the Middle East because the man wants to protect the woman. It's not about like disrespect, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's more about like, like the fact that he doesn't shake your hand is because he's respecting you, not disrespecting you. So if you're a woman and you go to uh, meet your, your Arab uh, partner in, in the Middle East, and then, the, you know, the man, and you're, you're standing with a male friend or partner, and then he shakes your male friend's hand and doesn't shake your hand not for disrespect it's for respect uh, i mean sometimes many times i offered my hand like i you know it's my default i always offer my hand and like and then all they do is they, they make a gesture like this on their chest like a gesture of sincerity and respect that no i'm not going to shake your hand but i greet you with respect so i was there like oh oops okay yeah so that happens um but yeah <clears throat> Any any other and, yes question, and, and one more and one more question I'm sorry I'm sorry to take your time on everything how does it happen at restaurants what is considered to be a good service when the waiter is always there or if it leaves them in tranquility and privacy if they take away the plates straight away or if it happens like in Europe you know they take away when everyone has finished what is considered to be a nice service. So I'm, I mean, I think that since Arabs really appreciate privacy, um, they wouldn't like to have someone standing there all the time ready, like, you know, what can I get you? What can I get you? That might irritate them. There should be a fine balance, like somebody should be uh, always, you know, ready in case they need something, like they can easily be, be called upon, like they're nearby, but not necessarily standing next to the table all the time. And yes, I think it's better to collect the plates uh, when, when they're empty and finished, you can take them away. Yes. Instead of letting them sit there. Thank you very much. No worries. My pleasure. <laughs> we can uh, probably take one more question and then we ought to, uh, let you go. Cause I'm sure people, even though you've politely stayed on, have things to do. Um, so any last question, anyone burning to ask something? Okay, well, it's been a pleasure having you and uh, nice to have so many people have stayed till the end, about two thirds of us are still here. So that was great. And, um, you know, do connect with us, for example, on LinkedIn. And if anyone is interested in taking this further with us with the more detailed consultation, for example, uh, with Cheryl or um, with myself on a more general topic, then uh, do feel free to get in touch with us. And um, uh, apologies, to, there were a couple of people who joined right at the last minute. I wonder if you thought that we were stating. Suzanne, how are you, by the way? I'm. I'm. Do you hear me? Yes. 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 You? Fine. Good. Great. I'm. Uh, yes. I'm sorry. I had another thing. Uh, I couldn't come earlier, but I heard that it will be recorded, right? Yes, it's been recorded. So we'll yeah. get that recording okay. at some point. Yeah. Sorry for being late. And a very nice seeing you, uh, Michael. Okay. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure. And Cheryl, thank you so much for joining me. Um, it's I always my pleasure. And, um, 
and I hope that people have got something out of it and um, things to take away. Please feel free, as Michael said, to keep in touch and do connect with us on LinkedIn if you're not already. Um, have a look at my website, CherylObel.com. You can always schedule a, a, like a free consultation through my website if you're interested. And I'm always happy to talk to people ab about culture. It's my favorite thing in the world. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent of living and working abroad because I know that it, it enriches your life in countless ways. And if I can help you, if you're interested in moving there or opening a branch of your company there or just, you know, doing business there, please feel free to connect with, with me and I will try to connect you with whoever I can and help you out the best I can. So thank you to everyone for sticking with us all this time. And who knows when we'll see you again. Take right. care. Good. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Michael, for hosting. You're welcome. <laughs> Take care. Bye.